So today we're looking at a few things that you're doing that might be keeping you broke. And the key word here is might. Being middle class or even lower class for that matter usually means that there's less room in your budget for error. So it might not take much to completely throw off your finances. So here are a few things that I've noticed people do that can potentially keep them stuck. Thinking that everyone is broke. And I bring this up because whenever I give tips on how to save money or how to build an emergency fund, or I'll watch other videos on that topic, there will always be that 5% or 10% in the comment section saying things like, this is pointless or everyone's broke or nobody has money to save. And they say it with so much conviction to the point where I think that some of these people actually believe that. And yes, I realize that we're dealing with inflation. So at the end of the day, you can only do what you can do. However, I still feel that thinking or believing that everyone is broke or that everyone is struggling has the potential to keep some people trapped in this cycle of complacency. Because when you perceive hardship as the norm, you might convince yourself that saving money is an unattainable goal and you might not even attempt it or even try to improve your financial situation so that you can. Now, this isn't to say that it's not hard to build a savings account or an emergency fund. It's not something that happens overnight for some people. Even so, the reality is there are many everyday middle-class people who have been able to save something through careful budgeting, discipline spending, and even supplementing their income. And again, you can only do what your circumstances allow, that's understandable. However, a shift in perspective could help you break free from the mindset of perpetual struggle so that you can start making small steps in the right direction. Because doing nothing almost guarantees that nothing will ever change for you. Another habit is worrying too much about looking cheap or broke. So occasionally I like to go and pop into these online forums that are talking about money so that I can see what people are thinking about and where their head is money wise. And one thing that I've come across several times is people admitting that they've gotten themselves into hot water because they didn't want to appear broke or cheap. So in other words, even though they knew that they weren't in a position to do something or buy something, they would do it anyway because they didn't want other people to know that they didn't have the money. And apparently a lot of people think this way. And unfortunately, if this is your pattern too, it is going to be increasingly difficult to dig yourself out of a hole. If anything, you're gonna dig yourself into a deeper one. And I understand that peer pressure can be difficult and it can also be difficult when your friends are able to do things that you can't. And to cope with this, the best tip I can give is for you to start embracing loud budgeting. If you're not familiar with this, loud budgeting is basically a concept of being more transparent about what you're able to do and what you're not able to do. However, it doesn't necessarily involve spilling the nitty gritty details about your financial life. Instead, it's being open about not spending money on things that don't fit into your budget or align with your goals. So instead of being ashamed about what you can't do or what you choose not to do, you embrace it loud and proudly. In addition, following your passion might also keep you broke. We've probably all heard the statement, follow your passion or the classic, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. But while this sounds good in theory, the reality is often quite different. Now, some people are fortunate and they've been able to support themselves nicely doing what they love. But for others, following their passion might lead to struggle and hardship. A while ago, I came across this article talking about the habits of people who have money. And some of the points discussed in there were pretty surprising. But one thing that really stood out to me was that a lot of these people don't always follow their passion as a career path. And the reason is because they know that their passion might not provide the income they need or want to care for themselves or their families. So instead, they purposely pursue opportunities that they know can provide more stability or where there's room for growth, and then they reserve their passion for hobbies or side hustles. So they're able to do what they love without the pressure of relying on it as a primary income source. And with that being said, you shouldn't put your passions on the back burner, which leads into another mistake, which is not monetizing your skills. Now, I'm not saying that you should start turning your hobbies into income sources, because if you did that, it would no longer be a hobby. What I am saying though is that, if you need to supplement your income and you also know how to do something well, leveraging your existing knowledge can be a fantastic way to earn extra money and keep your head above water. You might be someone who only needs to make an extra $150 or $200 a week. And if that is the case, before you immediately go and start applying for part-time jobs, 
sit down and brainstorm possible ways that you can make that amount or more in less time. For example, maybe you love cleaning and you're great at it. If that is the case, you might contact a few small offices in your area and see if you can clean two offices a week. If an office is 2,000 square feet, it might only take two to three hours to clean and you might be able to charge $125 per cleaning. And if that is the case, that's an extra $500 a month before taxes. And if you want an extra $1,000 a month before taxes, you can get two offices. And one good thing about this type of business is that supply supplies are relatively inexpensive and you probably already own most of the cleaning products. Another mistake is gifting beyond your means. So a while ago, someone told me that they weren't looking forward to the month of June because they had a wedding to go to plus four grad parties. And they jokingly said that buying gifts for all of these occasions were gonna put them in the poorhouse. Now, I don't know if they were exaggerating or being serious, but there was a lot of truth behind that statement because celebrating the milestones of others can be expensive. Now, when it comes to buying gifts, if you can afford it, it's usually not an issue. However, if you can't, don't feel guilty about having to scale back or get creative. For example, maybe you have a credit card that earns rewards. If you use this card often, you might accumulate a ton of reward points throughout the year. And if that is the case, when it's time to buy someone a gift, you could use those points to get them a $5 gift card to a coffee shop or someplace else. Over the years, I've received countless $5 gift cards from companies and individuals and let me tell you, I've appreciated every single one. So if you want to give a gift but can't do much, a small gesture like this can go a long way. And one thing that might help you feel better about this is to realize that if you're dealing with a reasonable person, they will understand your circumstances and they won't make you feel bad for giving your best. Now, an ungrateful person might, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. If someone wants to act stink or make it clear that your best isn't enough, at least now you know what you're dealing with and you don't need this person in your circle.